Network Theorems An electric network is a combination of various electric elements such as a resistor, capacitor, inductor, diode, etc. which are connected in any manner. A schematic of an electric network is shown in this figure. And electrical network analysis is a foundational concept in electrical engineering that involves the application of mathematical methods to determine the current, voltage and power parameters in various components of an electrical network. And this analysis is crucial in designing and optimizing the performance of electrical networks. Understanding these principles allows engineers to create models of electrical networks using schematic diagrams which serve as a blueprint for the construction of physical circuits and troubleshooting them. In this video and the following ones, we will discuss about some of the theorems that will help us completely solve and analyze voltages and currents in different elements of a network. There are two general approaches to network analysis, the direct method and network reduction method. In the direct method, the network is left in its original form while determining its different voltages and currents. And such methods are usually restricted to fairly simple circuits. The Kirchhoff's laws, loop analysis, nodal analysis, superposition theorem, compensation theorem and reciprocity theorem are all direct methods of solving electrical networks. In the network reduction method, as the name suggests, the original network is converted into a much simpler equivalent circuit for the rapid calculation of different quantities. And this method can be applied both to simple as well as complicated networks. And examples of this method include the delta star and star delta conversions, Thevenin's theorem and Norton's theorem, etc. In the following sessions, we'll deal with these theorems in detail. We'll begin our study with the Kirchhoff's laws. Kirchhoff's laws are after the famous physicist Gustav Robert Kirchhoff, who was a professor of physics at the University of Heidelberg. Although he is a contributor to a number of areas in the physics domain, he is best known for his work in the electrical area with his definition of the relationship between the currents and voltages of a network in 1847. He did extensive research with German chemist Robert Bunsen. Incidentally, it was Robert Bunsen who actually developed the Bunsen burner. And his association resulted in the discovery of important elements, cesium and rubidium. Kirchhoff's laws are useful to solve currents and voltages in electrical networks that may not be readily solved by using Ohm's law. Kirchhoff's laws are two in number and are particularly useful in determining the equivalent resistance of a complicated network of conductors and for calculating the currents flowing in the various conductors. Let us start with the first law which is also known as the point law or current law. In this figure, I have shown a simple electrical network and this consists of a voltage source V, resistors R1, R2, R3 and R4 which are connected in parallel. You can see that the total current that is flowing in the circuit is I. You can see that when the total current I reaches node A, it splits into I1, I2, I3 and I4 which passes through the resistors R1, R2 R3 and then R4. When these currents reach the second node, which I can designate as B, all these currents get added up and then finally we have the total current I flowing back to the voltage source. So points A and B are known as nodes. The Kirchhoff's point law or the current law applies to nodes in electrical circuits. To understand the Kirchhoff's point law or current law, let us consider a node A in an electrical circuit to which a current I1 is approaching. Another current that is approaching the junction or node is I4. You can see that in this figure, I2, I3 and I5 
are currents that leave the junction. Now, the Kirchhoff's current law or point law states that in any electrical network, the algebraic sum of the currents meeting at a node or junction is zero. Or in another way, it can be stated as the total current that is leaving a junction is equal to the total current entering the junction. We will now try to state the Kirchhoff's current law in mathematical form. As shown in the figure, some of the conductors have currents leading towards point A, whereas some of the conductors have currents that are leading away from the point A. We will take the sign of the incoming currents to be positive and that of the outgoing currents to be negative. If we write the point law or current law, I1 will be having a positive sign because I1 is the current that is coming towards point A plus I2 is a current that is leaving the junction so that has to be negative of I2 and I3 is also a current that is leaving the junction the sign has to be negative and I4 is a current that is coming towards the junction therefore its sign is positive and because I5 is a current that is leaving the junction its sign has to be negative and according to the law the algebraic sum of all the currents meeting a junction has to be equal to 0 or we have I1 plus I4 minus I2 plus I3 plus I5 equal to 0 or we can write I1 plus I4 equal to I2 plus I3 plus I5. Mathematically, this tells us that the sum of incoming currents will be equal to the sum of outgoing currents. Now, let us write KCL for the circuit shown. At node A, the current that is approaching the junction is I, therefore its sign is positive. And the currents that leave the junction are I1, then I2, I3 and I4. The algebraic sum of all the currents meeting the node A is equal to 0. Therefore, I equal to I1 plus I2 plus I3 plus I4. In solving electrical circuits using Kirchhoff's current law, the first step that we need to do is to fix the direction of the current flow. The direction of the current flow can either be assumed to be clockwise or anticlockwise. And the important point that we have to keep in mind is that once a particular direction has been assumed, the same has to be used throughout the solution of the problem. After solving the problem, if you see that the current has a minus sign, then that indicates that the assumed direction of current is not the actual direction. In that case, the actual direction is opposite to the assumed direction. In case if the answer is positive, then that indicates that the assumed direction is same as the actual direction. The important point is that in solving electrical networks using Kirchhoff's current law, the direction of the current is immaterial. That is, we can take the direction of the current in the clockwise or anticlockwise direction. But in analyzing the circuit, if we have taken the direction of the current as clockwise direction, then throughout the analysis of that particular circuit, we have to take the direction of current in the clockwise manner. In case if we are using the anticlockwise direction for the current in the circuit, then throughout analyzing the circuit, we have to take the direction of the current along the anti-clockwise direction. We shall now move on to what is known as Kirchhoff's mesh law or voltage law. In short form, it is known as KVL. Before that, let us try to understand the terms a branch, a node, 
a loop and a mesh of an electrical circuit. We have seen that a node is a junction in a circuit where two or more circuit elements are connected together. So in figure A, we have two nodes, point 2 and then point 5 are nodes. Figure B has two nodes. To understand that, we can redraw the figure. This is the voltage source. This is the resistor and this is the capacitor and this is the inductor and these are all connected to the same point. This is the voltage source V, resistor R, capacitor C and then inductor L. We see that figure B has two nodes so this is the first node and this is the second node. So we understood what is meant by a node. Now we will try to understand what is a branch. A branch is that part of a network which lies between two nodes. If we inspect, there are three branches in figure A. The two nodes are 2 and 5 and between 2 and 5, this one is a branch. That is the path that is consisting of R1 and the voltage source V. The second branch connecting 2 and 5 consists of the resistor R3. Whereas the third branch connecting nodes 2 and 5 consists of resistors R2, R4 and R5. So these are the three branches for the circuit shown in figure A. And there are four branches for the circuit that is shown in figure B. And the four branches are between 1 and 2. The first branch consists only of the voltage source V. The second branch consists only of the resistor R. The third branch consists only of the capacitor C. And the fourth branch consists only of the inductor L. We shall now try to understand what is meant by a loop. A loop is defined to be a closed path in a circuit in which no element or node is encountered more than once. If we consider figure A, we can see that there are three loops. The first loop consists of resistors R1, R2, R4, R5 and the voltage source V. So this is the first loop. And inside that loop, we have two sub loops. The first sub loop consists of resistor R1, resistor R3 and the voltage source V. The third loop consists of resistor R2, R4, R5 and then resistor R3. So altogether there are three loops for figure A. Now let us consider figure B. In this case we can find six loops. The first loop consists of V and L. So this is the first loop. The first loop consists of V and L. And then we can find a loop which consists only of V and C and then a loop consisting of V and R. So this one is the loop that is consisting of V and R, V and C and uh, this one is the loop that consists of V and R. Similarly, we can find a loop consisting of R and C. We can find a loop consisting of R and L. And we can find a loop consisting of only C and L. So this is the loop that is consisting of only C and L. And we can find six such loops for figure B. Now let us consider the case of a mesh. A mesh is a loop that contains no other loop inside that. We see that for this loop that is loop 1, 3, 4, 6, 1, there are two loops inside that is 1, 2, 5, 6, 1 and then 2, 3, 4, 5, 2. These are two loops that lie inside loop 1 and the meshes in figure A are 1, 2, 5, 6, 1. So that is the first mesh and the second mesh is 
2, 3, 4, 5, 2. So there are two meshes for the network that is shown in figure A. Now let us find the number of meshes that are present in figure B. Figure B has only three meshes. Mesh 1 consists of V and R. Mesh 2 consists of R and C. And mesh 3 consists of L and C. If I mark these points as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, then the meshes are 1, 2, 7, 8, 1. The second mesh is 2, 3, 6, 7, 2. And the third mesh is 3, 4, 5, 6, 3. In summary, figure A has 3 branches, 6 nodes, 3 loops and 2 meshes. Whereas figure B has 4 branches, 2 nodes, 6 loops and 3 meshes. With that understanding, we shall try to understand the Kirchhoff's mesh law or voltage law. We shall now move on to the statement of KVL. For that, let us consider a mesh or a loop like this. And this loop consists of a voltage source E, resistor R1 and resistor R2. The current that is flowing in the circuit is I and the potential drop across resistor R1 is V1, that across R2 is V2. We assume the direction of current in the clockwise direction. Then according to KVL, the algebraic sum of the potential rises and drops around a closed path or closed loop is zero. The potentials that are present in the circuit are E, then V1 and V2 and then according to KVL, E plus V1 plus V2 will be equal to 0. Or in other words, algebraic sum of all voltages in a circuit is equal to 0. We now need to understand what is meant by a potential rise and what is meant by a potential drop. Then accordingly, we have to fix the sign of V1 and V2 in this equation. As we read the statement of this law, two questions can pop up in our mind. The first question is, in which direction should we go to analyze this circuit? That is, should we go in the clockwise or should we go in the anti-clockwise direction? The answer is that we can analyze the circuit in any direction, that is clockwise or anti-clockwise direction. But the only thing is that we have to get back to the starting point. As an example, I have shown a circuit in this figure. If we start from point A, we can either move in the clockwise direction and then reach point A to complete the circuit. Or else, we can start from point A and then move in an anticlockwise direction to reach the same point A. So, we can analyze the circuit either in the clockwise or anticlockwise direction. But the only thing is that we have to get back to the starting point at the end. The second question is regarding the signs of the voltages across the various elements in the circuit. That is, we have to understand what is a potential rise and what is a potential drop and how to put the proper signs to the potential rises and potential drops in a circuit. We'll first understand the case of fall in potential, that is potential drop. For that, let us consider this resistor which is connected between points A and B. Let us assume that the current is going from point A to B. In that case, the polarity across the resistance will be like this. Because in an external circuit, current flows from positive to the negative terminal. Let us assume that we are analyzing the circuit along this direction, that is from left to right. When we move from point A to B, that is from left to right, we are moving from a positive to a negative potential. And that is considered to be a drop in voltage or a fall in voltage and the drop across the resistor will be taken 
as a negative quantity that is v will be equal to negative of i r now let us understand the case of rise in voltage we are considering the same resistor and in this case the direction of the current has been reversed now the polarity across the resistor will be like this the right side of the resistor will be more positive than the left side and let us assume that we are analyzing the circuit along the same direction as the previous one so in this case we are moving from a negative potential to a positive potential and that is defined to be a rise in voltage and in this case the potential drop across the resistor will be given a positive sign and that is equal to plus i r so this is rise in voltage and then fall in voltage in the first case we are analyzing the circuit from left to right that is from the positive side to the negative side so in this case the voltage will be given a negative sign therefore the potential drop across a resistor v equal to negative of i r in this case the direction of circuit analysis is from left to right on the left side we have negative potential and on the right side we have positive potential because the current is moving from right to left and as we are moving from a negative to a positive potential it will be considered as a case of rise in voltage and therefore the sign of voltage drop will be positive now let us come back to the statement of the law that is algebraic sum of the potential rises and then potential drops around a closed path or closed loop is zero in this case we are analyzing the circuit in the clockwise direction the direction of current is from left to right so this is the direction of current since we are analyzing the circuit in the clockwise direction this is the direction of movement or the direction of analysis because the current is from left to right the left side of the resistor is positive and the right side of the resistor is negative and as we move from left to right there is a fall in potential therefore v1 should be given the sign negative now let us analyze the second resistor so this is the direction of current and this is the direction along which we are analyzing the circuit because the top part of the resistor is positive and the bottom part is negative there is again a potential drop in the circuit or a potential fall in the circuit therefore the sign of v2 will also be equal to negative and this equation can be written as e equal to v1 plus v2 this is another form of stating the kirchhoff's voltage law as an exercise let us try to find out the potential drops across the various resistors in the circuit the resistors in the circuits are r1 r2 r3 and then r4 and then there are two sources e1 and e2 we have to find out the signs of different voltage drops in the circuit so we are doing that for the closed path a b c d and a a b c d a is a closed path and we are starting from point a the current that is flowing to resistor r1 is i1 and the potential drop across the resistor is i1 r1 since the current is flowing from left to right this side will be positive and this side will be negative and the direction of analysis is from left to right and therefore in this case there is a fall in potential and the sign of i1 r1 will be negative now let us consider resistor r2 the potential drop across the resistor is i2 r2 the direction of current is from top to bottom therefore this side will be positive and this side will be negative and this is the direction of analysis of the circuit and we are moving from a positive to a negative potential and therefore there is a fall in potential and the sign of i2 r2 will be negative now let us consider the resistor r3 the direction of i3 is along left to right 
therefore left side is positive and then right side is negative and we are analyzing the circuit from right to left because the direction of travel is in the clockwise direction so we are moving from a negative to a positive potential in this case we take this as a rise in potential or the sine of i3 r3 will be positive now let us consider r4 the current through the resistor is from bottom to top therefore bottom side will be positive and top side of the resistor will be negative the direction of travel or the di direction of analysis of the circuit is from top to bottom and we are moving in a direction of fall in potential therefore the sign of i4 r4 will be negative now let us try to find out the sign of the voltages across the sources that is e1 and e2 in the case of e2 the top side is positive and the bottom side is negative we are moving along the clockwise direction therefore we are moving from top to bottom and when we move from top to bottom there is a fall in potential therefore the sign of e2 would be negative in the case of e1 the top side is positive and then bottom side is negative and we are traversing along an upward direction because the direction of travel in the circuit or in the loop is clockwise direction so we are moving from a point of negative potential to a positive potential and by sign convention this is a rise in potential therefore the sign of e1 would be positive let us apply the kirchhoff's voltage law to the circuit across resistor r1 there is a potential drop and in this case we write this as i1 r1 the sign of the potential drop is negative that is minus i1 r1 and across resistor r2 we again have a potential drop so that is i2 times r2 across resistor r3 there is a rise in potential as we traverse along the clockwise direction therefore that is i3 r3 and across resistor r4 there is a fall in potential therefore that is i4 r4 across the voltage source e2 there is a fall in potential therefore that is minus e2 and across the source e1 there is a rise in potential therefore the sign is positive and according to kirchhoff's voltage law we have the algebraic sum of all the potential drops and potential rises in a circuit is equal to 0 this can be rewritten as i1 r1 plus i2 r2 minus i3 r3 plus i4 r4 equal to e1 minus e2 electric circuit analysis with the help of kirchhoff's laws usually involves solution of two or three simultaneous equations if we try to solve these equations manually by the systematic elimination of the variables the procedure will be lengthy and laborious and hence more liable to error we can use the method of determinants and cramer's rule to solve the network of equations through the manipulation of their coefficients and in this section we'll review our idea on solving simultaneous equations by using the method of determinants a second order determinant can be written as delta equal to a b c and d and when we compute this this will be equal to ad minus bc now a third order determinant will be having three square that is nine elements and that is written as delta equal to a1 b1 c1 a2 b2 c2 a3 b3 c3 
and when we calculate the determinant this will be a1 determinant of b2 c2 b3 c3 minus b1 then the determinant of a2 c2 a3 c3 plus c1 multiplied by the determinant a2 b2 then a3 b3 so this is how we define a determinant let us assume that we have two simultaneous equations ax plus by equal to c and then dx plus ey equal to f in this case x and y are unknowns a b d and e are coefficients of this unknowns and c and f are constants let us review the procedure for solving these equations by the method of determinants the first step of solving these equations is to write the equations in the matrix form in the matrix form this equation can be written as a b d e then multiplied by the matrix x y this is equal to the matrix of the coefficients c and f we define the common determinant as delta equal to determinant a b d e and this is equal to a e minus b d the third step we'll find the determinant of x for that we'll replace the coefficient of x in the original matrix by the constants so that we get the determinant delta 1 which is given by c b f e that is we'll replace a and d in the original matrix by cf and find the determinant delta 1 which is defined to be determinant c b f e this is equal to c e minus b f similarly to find the determinant for y we'll replace the coefficient of y by the constants so that we'll get delta 2 as equal to a c d f and that is equal to a f minus c d we'll now apply the Cramer's rule to get the value of x and y as x equal to delta 1 by delta that is c e minus b f divided by a e minus b d y is given by delta 2 divided by delta and that is equal to a f minus c d divided by a e minus b d and this is a very easy method to find out the unknowns x and y in a set of simultaneous equations we shall now try to solve this problem solve the following two simultaneous equations by the method of determinants the first equation is 4 i1 minus 3 i2 equal to 1 and the second equation is 3 i1 minus 5 i2 equal to 2 we have to first frame the matrix form of the equation the matrix form of the equation is 4 minus 3 3 minus 5 multiplied by i1 i2 so i1 and then i2 this is equal to the constant matrix that is 1 2 now delta is given by determinant 4 minus 3 3 minus 5 and this is equal to minus 20 plus 9 which is equal to minus 11 we now have to find out delta 2 and that can be obtained by replacing the row 4 3 
in the original matrix by the constants 1 and 2 therefore delta 2 is equal to 1 2 minus 3 minus 5 when we find out the determinant this will be equal to minus 5 plus 6 and that is equal to 1 now we have to find out delta 3 for that we will replace the column minus 3 minus 5 by the constants 1 and 2 and write the determinant as 4 3 1 2 and when we calculate the determinant that will be 8 minus 3 this is equal to 5 now according to Kramer's rule the unknowns i1 will be equal to delta 1 divided by delta that is equal to minus 1 divided by 11 similarly the unknown i2 would be equal to delta 2 divided by delta that is equal to 5 divided by minus 11 or that is equal to minus 5 over 11 so these are the two unknowns now let us see how to solve simultaneous equations with three unknowns. Let the three simultaneous equations be ax plus by plus cz equal to d, ex plus fy plus gz equal to h, jx plus ky plus lz equal to m. The first step is to write these in the matrix form. In the matrix form, this is A, B, C, E, F, G, J, K, L multiplied by the column matrix X, Y and then Z. This is equal to the constant matrix D, H and then M. The common determinant is delta equal to determinant A, B, C, E, F, G and then J, K, L. Determinant for x can be found out by replacing the coefficients of x in the original matrix by the constants. Therefore, delta 1 will be equal to we replace the first column of the common matrix by the constants d h and m and then write the determinant as d h m then b c f g k l similarly the determinant of y is written as delta 2 equal to a d c e h g then j M L. In a same way, the determinant for Z can be written as delta 3 equal to the first two columns are the same that is A E J, then B F K. The third column is replaced by the constant matrix that is uh, D H and then M. And by Kramer's rule, we can find X as equal to delta 1 divided by delta y as equal to delta 2 over delta then z as equal to delta 3 over delta solve the following three simultaneous equations by the use of determinants and Kramer's rule so we have three equations i1 plus 3 i2 plus 4 i3 equal to 14 i1 plus 2 i2 plus i3 equal to 7 2i1 plus i2 plus 2i3 equal to 2. We will first write these in the matrix form as 1, 3, 4, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2 multiplied by i1, i2, i3 equal to the constant matrix that is 14. 7 and then 2. Delta is given by the determinant of the matrix that is 1, 3, 4, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. 
and this is equal to 4 minus 1 minus 3 multiplied by 2 minus 2 plus 4 multiplied by 1 minus 4 and that is equal to 3 minus 12 which is equal to negative of 9. Delta 1 is obtained by replacing the first column by the constant matrix. So therefore delta 1 is equal to 14, 7, 2, then 3, 2, 1, 4, 1, 2 and when we compute this will be equal to 18. Similarly delta 2 is obtained by replacing the second column in the common matrix. So the first column is the same 1 1 2. The second column is 14 7 2. Then the third column is 4 1 2. When we compute delta 2 would be equal to minus 36. Similarly delta 3 is equal to 1 1 2 3 2 1 replace the third column by the constant matrix that is 14 7 2 and when we compute this one this will be equal to minus 9. Now i1 is equal to delta 1 divided by delta this is equal to 18 divided by minus 9 and that is equal to minus 2. Similarly i2 this will be equal to delta 2 divided by delta and that is equal to minus 36 divided by minus 9 and that is equal to 4. And i3 is equal to delta 3 divided by delta which is equal to minus 9 divided by minus 9 which will be equal to 1. So these are the various values of i1, i2 and i3. Let's do this problem where we have to find the voltage across points C and E. So these are the points point C and E. We have to find VCE and VAG. So to measure VCE, we'll place a multimeter or a voltmeter here and then connect through the wires and then we can find VCE. Similarly to find the voltage VAG we will use a voltmeter or a multimeter and one of the probes will be connected to point A and the other probe will be connected to point A. So keep this in mind this is how we measure VCE and VAG. And we have to calculate that by framing the equations for currents and voltages in the circuit. So we will begin like this. In this circuit we can find two loops which are connected to battery. So this loop is connected to a 20 volt battery and the second loop this one is connected to a 40 volt battery. We can find three resistors in each of these loops. In the first step, we will consider the two battery circuits separately. Our strategy to solve this problem would be to find out the different currents that are resulted in the circuit by the two EMF sources and from that we can calculate the potential draw at any of the points in the circuit. We will consider loop ABCD first and then write Kirchhoff's voltage law for this particular loop. The first step to write the Kirchhoff's voltage law is to find the direction of travel or the direction of analysis. Let us assume that we are analyzing the circuit in the clockwise direction. Let us assume that we start from point A. We go to B, C, D and then finally reach back to point A. Let us first fix the polarities of the components in the circuit. For the EMF source this will be positive and negative and since the resistor is connected directly and since the 6 ohm resistor is connected directly to the 20 volt source this point will be positive and this point will be negative and this point will again be positive and this will be negative and since the 9 ohm resistor is connected directly to 
the negative terminal of the battery this side will be negative and this side will be positive now let us assume that the current is flowing in this direction let us take that as i1 now let us proceed to write the kirchhoff's voltage law that is the algebraic sum of all the potential rises and potential drops in the circuit is zero starting from the emf source so the potential of the emf source is 20 and then the current i1 when it reaches the resistor 6 it has a potential fall since we are moving from positive to the negative side therefore we can write the potential drop as negative of 6 times i1 and when the current reaches the 5 ohm resistor it again sees a fall in potential because it has to traverse from the positive to the negative side so that is negative of 5 times i1 and again when it reaches a 9 ohm resistor there is again a potential fall and therefore we can write minus 9 times i1 equal to 0. When we simplify this this will be 6 plus 5 plus 9 times i1 equal to 20 from where we can find i1 as 20 over 20 and that is equal to 1 ampere. So we have found out current in one of the loops. Now let us consider the second loop that is EFGH. E F G H E. So this is the second loop. Again we assume that the current is flowing in the clockwise direction. We'll apply the Kirchhoff's voltage law for loop EFGH. In analyzing the loop EFGH, we'll ignore the presence of the other components and the other loops in the circuit. So in the previous case, when we considered A, B, C, D, we neglected the presence of all the elements that are outside that particular loop. So for the 40 volt power supply, we have fixed the polarity since the 8 ohm resistor is connected to the positive side of the battery this will be positive and this will be negative and this will be positive this will be negative this will be positive and this will be negative in this case the current flows in the opposite direction let us call that by i2 because uh, if it is in a battery so this is positive and negative inside the battery current will be traveling in this direction and at outside the battery it will travel along the positive to the negative terminal so in this case the current is going to travel from the positive to the negative terminal so the direction is opposite to the direction in which you are actually going to analyze the circuit so for the second loop the direction of travel for the 8 ohm resistor is from the negative to the positive terminal and therefore there is a rise in potential and we can write 8 times i2 as the potential drop across the 8 ohm resistor and now for the 40 volt power supply the direction of travel is from the positive to the negative terminal obviously there is a potential fall and therefore we can give it the proper sign and write minus 40 and for the 7 ohm resistor we are traveling from the negative to the positive terminal and therefore there is a rise in potential so this is 7 multiplied by i2 plus 5 multiplied by i2 because at the 5 ohm resistor we again have a rise in potential and the algebraic sum of all the rises in potential and fall in potential will be equal to 0. From where we can get 8 plus 7 plus 5 times i2 equal to 40 and this gives us i2 as equal to 40 divided by 20 and that is equal to 2 ampere. Now we are in a position to find out VCE that is the voltage that a multimeter is going to measure when we place the two probes at these two points. 
so let us assume this as a loop and then write the Kirchhoff's voltage law with proper sign convention. We will start from E, go to N and then reach B and then finally reach point C. So this is the direction of travel. In the next step we have to set the polarities for the elements in the circuit. In the previous slide we have seen that the direction of I2 is towards the right and the direction of I1 is towards the left. And since I2 flows in the anti-clockwise direction inside the second loop that is loop EFGH, this side of the resistor will be positive and this side will be negative. For the 10 volt supply this side is positive and this side is negative and since I1 is flowing in the clockwise direction in the second loop that is loop A, B, C and D this side of the resistor will be positive and this side will be negative. So we have fixed the various polarities for the circuit elements and we are in a position to write the Kirchhoff's voltage law. Let us consider the 5 ohm resistor first which is connected to the point E. When we analyze the circuit or when we move from point E to H there is a potential fall because we are moving from a positive to the negative terminal and because of that we have minus 5 multiplied by the current that is flowing in that particular branch is I2 and then when we move from point H to B there is a 10 volt power supply whose polarity has been shown and we are moving from the negative terminal to the positive terminal and therefore there is a rise in potential therefore this will be plus 10 and when we move from point B to C there is again a fall in potential but this time the current is I1 therefore this is negative of 5 multiplied by I1 and this will be equal to the voltage across point C and E. So this gives us VCE as equal to negative of I2 is 2 therefore 5 multiplied by 2 plus 10 minus 5 therefore VCE will be negative 5 volts. Now what is the significance of the negative sign in this voltage? VCE is negative. It indicates that point C is negative with respect to point E. Let's do the second part of the analysis now. That is we have to find out VAG. This is point A and uh, this is G to measure the voltage VAG. We'll place that multimeter here and the second probe of the multimeter or the voltmeter will be connected to the point G and then we can measure VAG. Let us consider this path for the analysis. So this is the direction along which we will be analyzing the circuit. For the 7 ohm resistor this side is negative and this side is positive. For the 10 volt power supply this side is negative and this side is positive. And for the 6 ohm resistor this will be plus and this side will be negative. Now let's write the Kirchhoff's voltage law. We start from point G. Then across GH we have a rise in potential therefore we can write 7 multiplied by I2 plus 10 since there is a rise in potential again and then across uh, the 6 ohm resistor connected between A and B there is again a rise in potential therefore that is 6 multiplied by I1 and this will give us the potential VAG therefore VAG is equal to 7 multiplied by 2 plus 10 plus 6 that is equal to 14 plus 16 and this is equal to 30 volt. So this voltage that is VAG has a positive sign that indicates that point A is at a positive potential of 3 volt with respect to point G. 
we shall now try to do this problem determine the currents in the unbalanced bridge circuit shown also determine the pd across bd that is we have to connect a voltmeter across bd and then find the potential drop across b and b and we also have to find out the resistance from b to d the problem may seem to be a little bit difficult to solve but but it can be readily solved using the kirchhoff's laws we'll be framing simultaneous equations with the currents as the unknowns and then we'll solve those equations using cramer's rule which we have covered in one of the previous sessions the various currents in the circuit are x y z then x plus y x minus z and then y plus z we have three unknowns we have to frame three equations to solve these to frame the first equation let us consider the loop d a c d that is d to a a to c then c to d let us assume that we are moving in the clockwise direction from d to a from the direction of the current we can take this side as positive and this side as negative there is an ammeter at the center having a 4 ohm internal resistance and the current z is approaching towards the ammeter in this case we can take this as positive and this side as negative from the direction of flow of the current and then from d to c the direction of current y has been shown and in this case this side will be positive and this side will be negative so we have fixed the polarities for the components in the circuit and we have also fixed the direction of analysis of the circuit let us start from the point d and go to point a so when we analyze the circuit along this direction from d to a there is a fall in potential and therefore we can write negative of x multiplied by 1 and while going from a to c there is again a fall in potential therefore the sign is negative the resistance is 4 ohms multiplied by current z and then when we go from c to d there is a rise in potential therefore this will be the resistance multiplied by current that is 2 multiplied by y according to kirchhoff's second law the algebraic sum of the currents will be equal to zero and from here we can write minus x minus 4z plus 2y equal to zero or x minus 2y plus 4z equal to zero we have three unknowns and we have framed the first equation similarly we have to frame two more equations to solve x y and z to frame the second equation we can consider any loop in this circuit let us take this loop that is a to b b to c and then c to a so we will be analyzing the circuit in the clockwise direction analyzing the circuit in the anti clockwise direction will also be correct and that will also give the correct result the next step is to fix the polarities for the currents the current that is flowing across a 2 ohm resistor connected between a and b is x minus z the direction of the current indicates that this is positive and this is negative now let us consider the resistor 3 ohms that is connected between b and c the current flowing in that part is y plus z and the direction of current indicates that this point is positive and this point is negative now in the case of the ammeter this side is positive and this side is negative let us start from a to b while going from a to b there is a fall in potential therefore we can write minus 2 multiplied by x minus z plus from going to c from b we have a rise in potential therefore we can write 3 multiplied by the current in the circuit that is y plus z plus 4z equal to 
because while going from C to A, there is a rise in potential. Therefore, minus 2x plus 2z plus 3y plus 3z plus 4z equal to 0. Minus 2x plus 3y plus 9z equal to 0, which gives us the second equation 2x minus 3y minus 9z equal to 0. So to frame the first equation we have considered the loop d a c d and to frame the second equation we have considered the loop a b c a. Now we have to frame the third equation for that we are going to consider the circuit d a b e d that is d a b from there we go to e and then finally we reach point d and this will be the direction of traverse we have taken the clockwise direction for this analysis even if we use an anti-clockwise direction that will also yield correct result and also it is absolutely not necessary that we should be considering this particular loop d a b e d if we consider d a b c d that will again give us an equation that could be used to solve the various currents in the circuit but let us consider d a b e d now we have to fix the polarities for the different elements in the circuit for the one ohm resistor between d and a this side will be positive and this side will be negative for the two ohm resistor between a and b this will be positive and this will be negative and when we come to the voltage source 2 volt it has an internal resistance of 2 ohms so it is equivalent to connecting a resistance like this which is having a resistance 2 ohms this is negative and this is positive therefore this side will be negative and this side will be positive so we have fixed the polarities for various elements in the circuit now let us write the Kirchhoff's voltage law for this loop we will start with E that is a 2 volt source that is connected to the circuit when we consider the direction of analysis we have a rise in potential that is we are moving from a negative to a positive terminal therefore the sine of 2 will be positive and as we move from D to A there is a fall in potential therefore this will be minus x multiplied by 1 when we travel from A to B there is a fall in potential therefore that potential drop will be 2 times x minus z and as we analyze the 2 ohm resistor which is adjacent to the 2 volt power supply which again is the internal resistance for the voltage source there is a fall in potential therefore we can write minus 2 multiplied by x plus y this is equal to 0 that is 2 minus x minus 2x minus 2z plus 2z minus 2x minus 2y equal to 0 2 minus 5x minus 2y plus 2z equal to 0 which gives us the third equation 5x plus 2y minus 2z equal to 2 so we have framed three equations to solve the three unknowns we will do the rest using the Kramer's rule the three simultaneous equations are x minus 2y plus 4z equal to 0 2x minus 3y minus 9z equal to 0 5x plus 2y minus 2z equal to 2 now we have to write the matrix form of the three simultaneous equations 1 2 and 3 this is 1 this is 2 and this one is 3 in the matrix form this is 1 minus 2 4 2 minus 3 minus 9 
5, 2 and minus 2 multiplied by the column matrix x, y and z equal to 0, 0, 2. We will use the Cramer's rules to solve the equation where delta is given by the determinant of 1 minus 2 4 2 minus 3 minus 9 5 2 then minus 2 and when we solve this the result will be 182 now we have to find out delta 2 for which will be replacing the first column that is 1 2 5 with the constant coefficients the constant coefficients are 0 0 and 2 therefore delta 2 is 0 0 2 minus 2 minus 3 2 then 4 minus 9 minus 2 and when we calculate the determinant it will be equal to 60 and then delta 3 that would be this is uh, delta 1 and this one is delta 2 delta 2 is the first column is same that is 1 2 5 is 0 now the second column that is this one has been replaced by the constant coefficients so that is 0 0 2 and then 4 minus 9 minus 2 when we calculate this will be 34 we now have to find delta 3 for which we will replace the third column with the constant coefficients therefore delta 3 equal to 1 2 5 minus 2 minus 3 2 and then 0 0 2 that will be 2 now the unknowns x will be equal to delta 1 divided by delta that is equal to 60 divided by 182 and that is equal to 30 divided by 91 amperes the unknown y will be delta 2 divided by delta that will be equal to 34 divided by 182 and that is equal to 17 divided by 91 amperes the unknown z would be delta 3 divided by delta and that is equal to 2 divided by 182 that is equal to 1 by 91 amperes and the other currents in the circuit that is x minus z x plus y and then y plus z can be found out by suitably adding or subtracting these values we now have to do the second part that is to determine the potential difference across BD and the resistance from B to D to measure the potential difference across D to B we will connect a voltmeter across DB from D to B the branch DAB the branch D C B and the branch D E B these are all at the same potential so we can calculate the potential difference across B D by considering any of these branches the simplest of these would be to consider the branch D E B so in the following analysis we are going to consider the branch D E B D E B consists of a 2 volt power supply having an internal resistance 2 ohms the internal voltage drop in the cell can be calculated by multiplying the internal resistance and the total current that is flowing in the circuit that is 2 multiplied by x plus y x plus y would be 47 divided by 91 and therefore this value would be 94 divided by 91 volts so this is the potential drop across a 2 ohm internal resistor so this is the internal resistor of the power supply 
having resistance 2 ohms. Now the potential drop across the points D and B would be the sum of these two potentials. Earlier we found out that this side is positive and this side is negative and this side is positive. Therefore with proper sign convention we can write the total potential difference as 2 plus minus 94 divided by 91 and that is equal to 2 minus 94 divided by 91 which is equal to 88 divided by 91 volts. Now let us calculate the equivalent resistance of the bridge between D and B which is given by the potential difference between point B and D divided by the current between point B and D. When we consider the branch DEB the current between points B and D would be x plus y Potential difference between points B and D is 88 divided by 91 divided by the current between points B and D is 47 divided by 91 that is 88 divided by 47 which is equal to 1.87 ohms.